Hi, everything I've shown you so far is supposed to be enough for you to be able to design and fold a simple model on your own. At least in theory. But before trying to do that, let's shed additional light on crease orientation. I won't be showing you anything new, all the rules will stay the same. Nevertheless, my experience is telling me that it could be quite tricky for newbies to define the orientation of all creases, especially in the context of flat foldability rules. That's why I've decided to dedicate yet another episode to that issue. In this episode I'm gonna walk you through one interesting and yet very simple example. The sole intention of this episode is to provide you with an additional example so you can gain additional experience in crease orientation definition. I'm also gonna show you how a crease pattern can be ill-defined, even though it satisfies all the rules. Okay, this is our very, very simple example. As you can see, it consists of only four flaps and one river. Since all flaps are in paper corners for most of the axial creases, we can define the orientation right away. You see? As a matter of fact, we can extend these axial creases into the river too. We can do it since we intersect no ridge creases whatsoever. Okay, now that we've defined axial creases, we can go further and define the orientation of ridge creases. Let's start with this one. As always, it's enough to define the orientation of only one segment. Nothing more than that. Defining the orientation of all other segments of the ridge crease should be fairly easy. For example, this one must be a mountain. Do you know why? I hope you still remember the rule that between two adjacent valleys, there should be a mountain, and of course vice versa. As you can see, this is just that kind of situation. Between two valleys we should have a mountain. So, now we know the orientation of one segment. To define the rest, just stick to the guidelines that a. A ridge crease changes orientation whenever intersecting with an axial crease, and b. The ridge crease orientation stays the same if the ridge crease changes direction. That's all you need to know. Of course, be aware that the solution we've come up with by following these rules is by no means the only one. Nevertheless, for the time being we'll follow these rules to the letter, since they will undoubtedly bring as to a workable solution. Not only to a workable but in my opinion, most likely to the very best one. At this point I'd again like to remind you that two ridge creases never intersect. They simply bounce into opposite directions the moment they encounter one another. That's why here in the center our ridge crease cannot continue straight forward, but has to turn at a 90 degree angle. So don't be mistaken, the actual ridge crease is this orange one. Not this straight one. That is important, because whenever a ridge crease changes direction, its orientation needs to stay the same. If a ridge crease were somehow allowed to continue straight forward, as shown, the orientation would have to change, and this wouldn't be correct. I hope this is clear. Now, let's do the same with the second ridge crease. Just define the orientation of one segment properly, and the rest should be easy. As you can see, it's really easy. But I'd like to show you an additional possibility. What if we decided to regard this orange line as a continuous ridge crease? Well, this would be fine too. Our ridge crease has just bounced into the opposite direction. That's all. Therefore, we can easily define the orientation of all ridge crease segments in that direction, since we already know the orientation of a half of all ridge crease segments. But what's especially alluring with this approach is the fact that we don't have to erase the orientation of the ridge crease segments that we've already defined. This approach is possible since the rules are universal, regardless of the configuration of the ridge crease we've chosen. Provided, of course, that we've defined the initial ridge crease properly. What does it mean? Well, it means that knowing the orientation of only one initial ridge crease segment allows us to define the orientation of all ridge creases that are somehow connected to it. But what about this part here? Well, it is quite easy to define its orientation. We just have to define this orange line as a complete ridge crease. This is perfectly legitimate. So, since we know the orientation of half of all the segments in this new ridge crease, it's quite easy to define the rest. As easy as that. You see, we only need to know the orientation of one initial segment. Nothing more. Based on the orientation of only that one segment, we were able to define the orientation of almost all ridge crease segments in our example. Now, what about the creases for which we haven't set the orientation yet? 
As you can see, there aren't many left. These ridge creases are in no way connected to the already oriented ridge creases, so we cannot use the approach just shown. But we can do something else. We can rely on the fact that all of these unoriented creases are a part of a river. Since we know that a river always has transversal creases that without exception, constantly change their orientation. Mountain, valley, mountain, valley etc., it is quite easy to define the orientation of all the remaining creases. The only thing we have to do is to continue setting the crease orientation from the crease with a known orientation. For example, this crease is a mountain, meaning the next one must be a valley, then a mountain again, and then a valley until we define all the creases. The same approach can be taken for the rest of the paper. You see? Quite easy. With this we've managed to define the orientation of all axial and ridge creases. What's left open now is the main question. What about flat foldability rules? What about Miyakawa's and Kawasaki's theorems? A quick look is enough to see that only in three vertexes these theorems are not satisfied. That's not much. That's why I've told you that this was a fairly simple example. So, what do we need to do? Well we can start with any of them, but my suggestion is to start with the vertexes that are near the paper edges. For example, we can start with this one in the lower part of the paper. This vertex is interesting because it has five creases. One is obviously missing, since the number of creases must be even. To be more precise, a mountain is missing, because the vertex consists of three mountains and two valleys. What's more, the only direction in which we can add this mountain is upward. There is no other option whatsoever. Regardless of what we do with other vertexes, the only way to solve the problem of this one is to add another mountain in its upward direction. That's why I've suggested to start with this vertex. Because its situation is clear. So let's draw a crease in the upward direction, but mind that we have to extend the crease until we hit the central vertex. A crease cannot finish in the middle of a paper. I hope you've learned and memorized that from one of the previous episodes. You see how long this crease is? The same idea applies to the vertex on the left side. Since Miyakawa's theorem is not satisfied there either, we have to add another crease rightward. There is no other option. This crease too has to go all the way to the central vertex. You see? Well, this is more than nice, since if we analyzed the central vertex, we'd realize in a split second that this vertex initially also lacked a few creases. To be precise, two creases were missing, which is exactly what we've added by extending two additional creases from two vertexes in the lower and left part of the paper. So, now we have all the necessary creases, but still don't know if these creases have the right orientation. Let's check this out. Let's start from the vertex in the lower part of the paper. We know that the first segment of the new crease must be a mountain. I hope you understand that. If we want to satisfy Miyakawa's theorem, it is obvious that the first segment must be a mountain. But solving the problem in this vertex will inevitably create a problem in the next one. See, here we have two valleys and one mountain. It's therefore obvious that we need an additional valley. The next segment must therefore be a valley. Take a look at the next vertex now. Again, one mountain is missing. Let's add one. As you can see, we're dealing with the problem by passing it on to the next vertex each time, up to the point where we'll have reached the central vertex. You see, the central vertex was initially two mountains short. So adding one is a good thing. The same procedure can be applied to the crease that stretches from the left vertex to the central one. We'll start with a mountain and having applied all the rules, end up adding a mountain in the central vertex too. Exactly as needed. Having done this, we can now say that our model is fully defined as flat foldable. Now, a new question arises. Would you be able to fold this model on your own? It shouldn't be that difficult, since this model doesn't have so-called central flaps. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have flaps on the edges either. It has flaps only in the corners. So, what do you think? Would you be able to fold this model on your own? Well, you should be. As you've just seen, it wasn't that difficult at all. You see, we have a model consisting of four flaps and one river. If you take a good look, you'll notice that since the river is separating only one flap from the rest of the model, it acts as if it were a part of that flap. 
as if there were a single flap, 5 units long. Now, of course, I'd like to talk about flat foldability. As you can see, we can flatten the whole model into a single plane. You see that this is entirely possible. No wonder, since the model is designed as flat foldable. But what is of greatest interest to us is this small flap over here. It can be rotated around its hinge crease. But if we flatten the whole model, this crease disappears. There's simply no crease whatsoever. Take a good look. You see, there is nothing, the paper is fully flat. Don't be mistaken by the fact that there is a crease left from the initial creasing when we were setting up the initial grid. We aren't talking about the creases you can see on the paper, we're talking about the creases that are actually used. This is important for you to realize. In this flattened form, even though there is a crease, it is not used. When a crease is not used, it is considered non-existent. This is clear, I hope. Now take a look at the crease pattern. You'll see that there is no single hinge crease around the polygon this flap is made of. And that's fine. That's completely correct, because this flap, when flattened like this, virtually doesn't have a single hinge crease. Have a good look. You see? No hinge crease whatsoever. But if we flip it over to the other side and flatten the model again, the situation will be completely different. Still, the model will remain flat foldable, no doubt about it. You see? We can flatten it without any problems. The only difference is that we've got additional creases. Look at the crease pattern. So if I turn this flap back, these new creases will disappear. You see? If we flip it over again, the creases will appear again. I hope you see connection. But what's gonna happen if we flip this flap in the counterclock direction? Well, this crease will become a mountain. I hope you can see it. What's more important, such a move will force other two flaps to flip into that direction too. Now, look at the crease pattern. It looks more complex, but it's still fine. The model is still flat foldable. We've just acquired additional creases, but the model can still be completely flattened. So, why am I showing this to you? Well, I'd like to point out one possible strange situation. Can we imagine a situation in which the first flap is turned clockwise into this direction, while the other two flaps stay in their previous positions? Of course not. It'd be physically impossible. But can we draw a crease pattern with such an odd configuration? Unfortunately. Yes. Look at the crease pattern. This is the correct one, meaning the other two flaps must get additional creases if we want to make our first flap go in the counterclock direction. Simply put, two additional flaps must turn into the counterclock direction too. However, if we keep the middle and the left flap initial hinge creases, we'll get this configuration. This means these flaps are in their initial position. This is physically not possible, but nevertheless let's do it. Okay, let me repeat it, we all know that this is not physically possible. I hope that's clear. But this is not the question. The question is, is this crease pattern in line with all the rules? Yes, of course. Take a good look at the crease pattern. There are no vertexes that do not satisfy Miyakawa's or Kawasaki's theorems. And yet we know that something like this is not possible. So, this is what I'd like to point out. You could in some strange circumstances, draw a perfectly correct crease pattern that produce an unfoldable model. But don't be too confused. This example is deliberately made this way. This is a very simple example, so that it offers many possible ways to achieve flat foldability. Some of them are obviously not possible to realize. In reality such situations are quite rare, but nevertheless possible. So be cautious. That's all. That'll be all for this episode. In the next one we're gonna deal with a more in-depth analysis of the crease orientation.